Oh, what a blessing to be together, to come together to worship the God of the universe. God of the universe who we worship here this morning, every week, and hopefully every day. We also hear from his word and hear from him. 2,000 years ago, approximately, he wanted to communicate with us a little better so we could understand him more. And so he sent the one and only God the Son into this world, Jesus. And over the years, many people have tried to understand and explain Jesus. And I really like how um, a preacher about uh, almost 100 years ago uh, explained in one of his sermons. This was a, a description of Jesus given by James Allen Francis in 1926. And in this sermon, this little part of his sermon, it, was, it became so popular, it was named, and it was given the name of a, a poetry piece called One Solitary Place. And so hopefully you can follow along here as I read it. Here is a man who was born in an obscure village as a child of a peasant. He grew up in another obscure village. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30 and then for three years was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held office. He never owned a home. He never had a family. He never went to college. He never put his foot inside a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He never did one of the things that usually accompanies greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He had nothing to do with this world except the naked power of his divine manhood. While still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him, another betrayed him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed upon the cross between two thieves. His executioners gambled for the only piece of property he had on earth while he was alive, or sorry, while he was dying, and that was his coat. When he was dead, he was taken down and laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen wide centuries have come and gone today, and he is the center of the human race and the leader of the column of progress. I'm far within the mark when I say that all the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed or been built, all the parliaments that have sat, all the kings that have ever reigned, all put together have not affected the lives on this earth as powerfully as that one solitary life. When you think about Jesus, and you think about the small footprint he had on earth, yet such a large um, change that he, he made for this world. Someone said, there's no other person who has divided time. He is the most recognized and the most, um, uh, um, the most uh, person who has made the most change that has ever walked the foot of this earth. And if Jesus is this important, he's still here today, but we've been given his teachings. And so how much in your life, in my life, should we be devoting to Jesus' teachings? His teachings are foundational. And if we are to make disciples... Making disciples means that we are in his word learning from him and that we are using that knowledge to teach others. And so that's a part of discipleship. We've been looking at discipleship for a couple of years and in our new series we've been going through, we're talking about at the foot of Jesus, looking through the gospels through the eyes of disciples to learn about discipleship. And as Jesus begins his ministry, right near the beginning of his ministry, Matthew and Luke both give a bit of attention to this sermon that we call the Sermon on the Mount. And this is found, actually, Matthew devotes three chapters to this Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is found in Matthew chapter 5 through 7 and also found in Luke chapter 6. And this is some of the core teachings of Jesus. Jesus was trying to make clear that God sees through their masks. God sees through what they're doing to why they're doing it. He, even, he knows that today. God knows our hearts, and God wants our hearts. You see, the easy thing for us to do, I'll use giving as an example. Someone says, how much do I need to give? What makes God happy? Just give me a number, I wanna know what the number is. But Paul writes that God loves a cheerful giver. And as we reap, as we sow, we will reap. And so that's difficult for us, but God, what God's saying is, God wants your heart into your giving. 
You see, there's a lot of things that we do that our hearts are in the wrong place, but we're, we're doing it. It looks right on the outside, but it's our hearts, our motives are wrong. The Jews had the same thing. You know what they used to do? The Jews, and Jesus is going to talk about some of this stuff. So the Jews, they used to, they knew don't commit adultery. And so they knew that it was wrong to cheat on their spouse. So what would they do? Well, they made it super easy to divorce. And so they would go and just, well, I'll just get a divorce from you. Marry this person. Oh, divorce you. Go back to this person. And it was just a way of sleeping around, trying to do it within the, the legalities of the law. They were trying to, to work around the technicalities of it. They do that with all kinds of things. For example, when Jesus talks about their oaths, we're going to look at some of these things in a minute. Keeping your word. You know, they knew that they had a saying, you know, certain oaths, if you swore by this or you swore by this, it was binding. Jesus is saying, you know what, you shouldn't have to have oaths. If you have to have an oath for someone to trust you, there's a problem. Basically, that means that anything you say is not trustworthy unless you make an oath. And so again, their hearts were in the wrong place. Their motives were wrong. And we do that today. And so today we might, um, and we might say, you know, I know it's wrong to lie. I'm not going to lie. But what we might do is find a way to lie where it's not really a lie. Maybe we omit information or we do things. I'm guilty of that. We do that. We know that it's wrong to steal. And so what do we do? We justify the theft. Well, they owe me. This would be like them paying me back. So we justify our stealing. We justify our lying. We justify, for example, not having in a relationship. Someone says, well, I caught my spouse lusting after someone else. So I can divorce them based on what Jesus says. We do things like this. And all I'm saying is God knows our heart and we need to give serious um, consideration to the reasons behind the things that we do. Because Jesus directly addressed it with these people. And Jesus was clear with them and we're going to look at that. Now, what we're about to, to look at, I want to remind you, we're going through a series through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We happen to be in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. So if there's something that I say this morning, just something like, for example, talked about, you know, lying or something, and you're like, oh, Jamie knew that I did the such and such. This must have been made up for me. I do not make up sermons for people. I've never done that. I do not do that. So if you think that something in here was made for you, it's not me. I'm just preaching where we are, we are in the series. But if you feel convicted, and if you feel embarrassed, and if you feel that you're wrong, then that's good. That means Jesus is speaking to your heart. And that means that you'll try and change. There's a passage, Paul says, godly sorrow brings repentance. And so we should be sorry for our sins. We should be sorry for the things that we've done wrong, and we should try and change. Actually, change is one of the first things that Jesus talks about in this Sermon on the Mount. He tells us that we should, first he goes through the Beatitudes, then he talks about us being lights to this world. We should be different. We should be lights to the world. Because that's what it is being an image bearer of God, to wear his name. We represent him. We should show the world what God has made us to look like. The next thing Jesus talks about is the law, fulfilling the law. And so Jesus says, you know, in um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, don't think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And a lot of times, I'm like, what does this mean? Because he's going to start talking a bit about the law. You have heard it said, but I say to you, things that they would have understood. Matthew, the readers of Matthew, understand the Old Testament. And I recognize some of us here, especially if you're visiting with us, you might be like, I've never read the Old Testament. I've read it. I don't understand it. And so some of this stuff might seem foreign. So again, trying to explain a little bit the best I can. The more you're in it, the more you will understand it. The Word of God is like putting together a puzzle. The more pieces you put together, the better the picture becomes. And you're like, ah, I'm starting to get it. Okay, so Jesus fulfilled the law a couple of ways. Number one, um, he was the fruition of many prophecies. So many things that were said that, that God said were going to happen came true with Jesus. 
Jesus lived the law perfectly. He showed them how to live it perfectly. The law wasn't the problem. People are the problem. Jesus was the final sacrifice. You, don't, you no longer need bulls and goats and the sacrifices because Jesus was the final sacrifice. And Jesus fulfilled the old covenant, the first one. And he established a new one. A covenant is a contract. And so that's what Jesus does is he makes a new contract in his blood. A contract between us and God through Jesus. Okay, so that explains a little bit of the beginning. Be lights to the world. I've come to fulfill the law. And then he gets into this. Now, there's all kinds of things that are talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. He goes through again the Beatitudes. And he talks about things like anger, watching our anger, marital faithfulness, being truthful versus lying, being a giving person, being a person of prayer, being a loving person. How do you deal with anxiety? How do you deal with judgment? How do you deal with being judged or judging others? How do you deal with giving in your possessions? All these things Jesus talks about within those three chapters. I love these three chapters in Matthew. First of all, each one of these sections, you can see in our Bibles, we have little, there are little, pair, little subsections and whatnot with little titles. In the original, as Matthew recorded it, there was no chapters and verses and subheadings. It was just all written out. But I like that we've put it this way. And if you're looking to get into God's word a little bit every night, that's a way to do it. Read one of these sections each night. And we could do a sermon on each of these sections. If we did do that, if we took our time, we'd probably be a few years in the gospel. So we're, we're not spending a time in each of those. We'll save that for our times together in classes and in our discipleship groups. Now, to begin, I'm going to look at some of these things. The first thing, let's take a look at being an example. Let your lights shine in this world. Jesus tells them to be a light in this world, to be clearly different than others. And when you look at some of the statistics on people who are turned off by church, the greatest thing that turns people off is being hypocritical. The hypocrisy of Christians. And whether we believe it or not, but calling ourselves followers of Jesus, being like Jesus, being Christians, Christ-like, but many people say you're nothing like Christ that we read in the Bible. People tend to want Christ, but not the church. I've heard that so many times. You've probably heard that. There's some statistics that have been put out there. Barna does a lot of statistics on these things. As far as two years ago or even last year, hypocrisy of religious people is the number one turnoff why people doubt Christianity. Okay. There was another poll that was done. These are going to be hard to read, sorry. But people don't have as much a problem with Jesus or with spirituality or with the Bible or Christianity. These are pretty hard. Here's with people. People start to have take issue with people. It's the people who represent Jesus that are the problem, not Jesus himself nor his teaching. If we are to make God attractive... If we want people to be in this word and show them the changing power of Jesus, we need to be careful how we live. We need to do our best to put this into practice. And there are many people out there who have lived attractive lives. I mean, I've met people that I'm like, I want to live like them. And all they're doing is living their faith, but they are different. They're different than the world because they're putting the teachings of Jesus into practice. And by the way, there's been all kinds of polls and studies and stuff done. If you put the, practice, the teachings of Jesus into practice, it will improve your life in every way. But here's the problem. We don't put them into practice to have a better life. Well, it's a, that's a byproduct, but that's not the purpose of doing it Because Jesus says, I want you to live this way and I want you to go and sacrifice your lives, be, be a gift to the world. If you were doing it for your own health, your own benefit, your own sit back and enjoy life perfectly, there's a problem because Jesus says, I want you to live this way. It's a better way of living. And by the way, your life might be cut short due to persecution or troubles or trials. It's like that doesn't make sense, Jesus. You see, Jesus is looking at life, not just the few years you have on earth. This way of living is a better way of living on earth 
and into eternity. And that's what it's about. So, be a light to the world. Be careful with your anger. The next little section, and I'm not going to deal with them all, just a few of them. The Bible is full of, of information about watching our anger. A person's anger doesn't bring about the righteous life that God so desires, James would say. Be careful that you don't go to bed angry, Paul would say. Anger, how many of us have made terrible decisions when we're angry? And then some of us, have, some of us aren't even here because of decisions we've made while we're angry. It's changed or altered our life, changed where we end up, changed the course of the future for us. Our anger can cause a lot of problems. And Jesus, you know, he says, you know, he talks about even murder. Sometimes our anger can lead to murder. So you've heard don't murder. Jesus said, be careful. The root of this goes back to this anger and hatred. Another thing Jesus talks about is sexual immorality and adultery. And so again, the Jews, you know, they found a way to have divorce for any reason. Well, uh, the, you know, and, and uh, the, you know, they would come up with, I don't know, the, the toast was burnt, second day in a row, I'm going to have a divorce. You know, there were terrible reasons that they had for being allowed to divorce. God knew their hearts. And so Jesus says, even if you look at someone lustfully, you've committed adultery. It comes from within the heart. Watch your attitude. God sees behind the mask that you have on your face. And so Jesus said, this is a serious thing. So serious, if your eye causes you to, to sin, gouge it out, or your hand, cut it off and throw it away. Jesus isn't saying literally do this. You know, if you gouge your eyes, you can still see things in your mind. You still have problems. And so, Jesus, this isn't meant to be literal, but Jesus is saying, look, this is serious. This is a serious concern. He goes on to talk about truth. You must, you've heard it said, you know, you don't break your oath. In the Old Testament, there are oaths that you would take. <clears throat> well, it got to the point where they were making all kinds of types of oaths. You know, well, if you made this oath, it's not really binding. You go to court, you go to, you know, before the judge. Well, Your Honor, I said it, I, I made my oath based on this and not this. Oh, okay, well, that wasn't binding. You should know that's not binding. They had this system. It's crazy. What? Is it? I mean, if they look at the, some of the things we do and the justifications we make, we wouldn't find it so crazy. People are people. And so Jesus gets right to the root of it. Look, let your yes be yes and your no be no. He's not saying you can never take an oath. He's saying you should be people of integrity. You should be different. You should be open and upfront and honest. You shouldn't tr be trying to cheat others and to take advantage or to lie and steal. You should be a light to the earth. I really liked what uh, I heard once, by the way. If, uh, so there's a lot of things in the scripture about lying. And someone said... No one has a good enough memory to be a successful liar. You will always get caught and you'll not be trusted and it'll do a lot of damage to your own life and more importantly, to the word of God. And then he talks about giving. <clears throat> this turn the other cheek. <clears throat> you know, this isn't, a, this isn't a, a rule for abuse. This isn't God saying, you know, look, you need to be abused and let people take advantage of you. You have nothing. Paul actually says in the Bible... That when you give, the goal is not so that you give everything, <clears throat> so that now you're the needy one, but there should be equality. Paul talks about that as he writes to the churches in Corinth, and he talks about the Thessalonians. So this, this idea of giving so that there's equality and helping one another out. So what's Jesus talking about here? He's talking about just being a giving person. Not being, you know, we're always demanding of our rights and going the extra mile, doing what's different from the world. And when you lend, if you don't get something back and someone's not, you know, just be careful when you lend that you might be giving that. And Jesus is saying, watch how you respond. And we see this with the unmerciful servant. That one who owed a lot of money and he came before the king and the king forgave him billions of dollars. <clears throat> And then he went out and found someone who owed him a couple hundred dollars. And he went over and he, he strangled him and had him put in prison. And he's saying, that, that's what we can be like. And we're not to be like that. We are to be people who are different. And then he talks about loving your enemies. <clears throat> you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. You know, they had a problem because they used to define who their neighbors were. 
Well, I can be rude to that person because they're not my neighbor, right? And Jesus addresses that in other passages as well. The good Samaritan, who's my neighbor? Let me tell you who your neighbor is. That Samaritan who you hate and who hates you, you guys are neighbors. The neighbors are the ones that, all those people around you are God's, they're God's creation. People, your next door neighbors, your coworkers, the, the newsflash for some, the people that you hate, that you don't like, were made in God's image, and God loves them. Love your neighbor. Pray for your enemies. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You know, this was written, or not written, <clears throat> this was preached near the beginning of Jesus' ministry. I wonder if people listened to this, and when the church began and they had church service, and when they were getting up for announcements and someone said, I have an announcement, just so you guys know, be on the watch, we gotta be really careful. There's this guy going around named Saul and he's going from church to church and he's taking us and putting us in prison and, and killing some of us. And you know what? Let's pray that God kills this guy and gets rid of him. I wonder if that's what was said or if someone came up and said, guys, there's this Pharisee named Saul who's doing a lot of damage to the churches. Jesus tells us to pray for enemies. Let's pray for him now. And you remember on the road to Damascus, Jesus met that man and changed that man. And that man ended up writing 13 of the 27 books in your Bible. And so pray for your enemies. Be different. That's what Jesus taught. And as disciples, we ought to be listening to the words of Jesus, whether you like it or not, whether you understand it or not. Try and understand, just trust him. And so we're different. <clears throat> and of course, oh, of course, uh, agape love. Unconditional love to imperfect people is in that love your neighbors. And, and that's what he says. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. If you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing out of the ordinary? If we're just a church that just, you know, welcomes people that make us comfortable, people that don't annoy us, we're no different than the world. Everybody, that's easy. If we are a church who tries to help and change difficult people, and we're putting up with things that don't make us comfortable, but we're doing it for the sake of love, for converting them, for teaching them the love of Jesus, we're different. That's who God calls us to be. And so we're different from the world. So common wisdom versus Jesus' wisdom. Common wisdom says love your neighbor, hate your enemy. Jesus' wisdom says love your enemies. Common wisdom says give to the needy in public. Jesus says give to the needy in secret. Pray worldly prayers in order to gain attention says the common wisdom. God's wisdom is pray humbly and in secret. Fast in public so people see that you're a person of faith. No, fast in secret. Store up treasure on earth, the world says. Jesus says, accumulate treasure in heaven. Worry in order to solve problems, the world says. Jesus says, don't worry, seek God's kingdom first. God will, will provide. The world says, concentrate on the sins of others and, you know, Deal with your own sin first. Take out the plank of your own eye first before the speck of dust. This is what Jesus is talking about. And again, if any of this hits us hard, it should. Because godly sorrow, godly grief produces the repentance that leads to salvation. And so we ought to be changing ourselves first in order to change the world. And that's what discipleship is about. Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And then he says, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded. If you're not in God's word, how will you know what to teach them? If you don't, if Bibles were gone tomorrow, would you have any clue what to teach people? The more you're in God's word, the more you're going to remember, the more that will stick. The early church never had the New Testament. And yet they knew what to teach. They knew what to preach. And the church grew. They, they were committed to one another daily. They were in God's word daily. 
We probably have more time available to us now, but we have so many distractions. Be in God's word. John says, if you continue in my word, you are my disciples. So learn and teach. And uh, I'll just end with two thoughts here. First of all, about 1,400 years before Jesus gave this Sermon on the Mount, there was another mountain where God's people came to hear God's commands. And on that mountain, there was lightning and thunder, and the mountain shook, earthquake, and the people were trembling in fear. Exodus chapter 20, 21. And they said to Moses, you teach us. We can't listen to God or we'll die. And we read the Hebrew writer says, Moses himself was trembling in fear. The people, God is so big, the God of the universe who tries to communicate with us. They say, we want to hear you. We want to see you. And God shows himself just his voice. And they get so scared. We don't want to see you. We don't do it a different way. And so God spoke through Moses. And they still didn't get it. And so finally, God comes himself to be one of us. And here he is on a different mountain, speaking the commands and telling us what's behind them all, the law of love. And did people listen? And the question is, here we are today. You're at the mountain right now. You're at the foot of the hill while Jesus is teaching the Sermon on the Mount. Are we going to listen? Be in our words so we can go and make disciples who will listen, who will make disciples, who will make disciples. I'll finish with... I'll finish with this. Jerome said this. I love this quote. The scriptures are shallow enough for a babe to come and drink water without fear of drowning and deep enough for theologians to swim without ever touching the bottom. You can never get enough of God's word. So let's remember to be in it, to go swimming every day and look at the treasures you'll find so that we can help grow the kingdom of God for his glory. Let's stand as we sing.